Hi out there. Hopefully this uh, recording today will show you the invisible change that hold us in slavery. So uh, let's get started and see if we can... Uh, we'll start off with a little history lesson. Before the year 1066, the people of England held a lodial title to their land. Not even the king could take the land for not paying a tithe. But William the Conqueror came in in 1066 and stole the king's title and took the land off the people. Now, there's a, a new word up there probably for a lot of you, which is lodial, and that means free. So they had free title to their land, not subject to the rights of any lords or superiors or owned without obligation or vassalage or fealty, the opposite of feudal. A description given to the outright ownership of land that did not impose on its owner the performance of feudal duties or any other thing. Now, William the Conqueror was a Duke of Normandy, and if you don't know where Normandy is, that is in the, uh, the corner of France, right by the English Channel there, which is where the English language came from. And William I became the first Norman King of England. He defeated and killed the last Anglo-Saxon King of England at the Battle of Hastings. William was born in around 1028 in Falais, Normandy, the illegitimate son of Robert, the first Duke of Normandy. He was known as William the Bastard, I may have been called that too, to his contemporaries. On his father's death in 1035, William was recognised as heir, with his great uncle serving as regent. In 1042, he began to take more personal control. From 1046 until 1055, he dealt with a series of baronial rebellions. William's political and military successes helped him in negotiations to marry Matilda, daughter of Count Baldwin of Flanders, in 1053. Early in 1066, Edward, who was then the King of England, died, and Harold, Earl of Wessex, was crowned king. William was furious, claiming that in 1051, Edward, a distant cousin, had promised him the throne, and that Harold had later sworn to support that claim. William landed in England on the 28th of September 1066, establishing a camp near Hastings. Harold had travelled north to fight another invader, Harold Hardrada, King of Norway, and defeated him at Stamford Bridge near York. He marched south as quickly as he could, and on the 14th of October his army met William's. It was a close-fought battle lasting all day, but Harold was killed and his army collapsed. William was victorious, and on Christmas Day 1066 he was crowned king in Westminster Abbey. A Norman aristocracy became the new governing class, and many members of the native English elite, including bishops, were replaced with Normans. Okay, from... From that time, when William took over, and, and until King John in 1199, England was in dire straits financially, uh, to the Pope this was, and in an effort to raise money, King John invoked the law of Mort Main, which happens to be the dead man's hand. So people were unable to pass their land on to the church or anyone else without the king's permission, which is what we have today, such as modern day probate. Without Mortmain, the king would lose the income from the land he controlled. And the Vatican didn't like that because the king was in debt to the, to the Vatican. A quarrel erupted between the Pope and King John when he refused to accept the Vatican's representative, Stephen Langton, whom Pope Innocent III installed to rule England. In 1207, English, England was placed under papal interdict, and two years later... King John was excommunicated. Stephen Langton was born in 1150 and died in 1228. And he was the Archbishop of Canterbury between 1207 and his death in 1228. And he was a central figure in the dispute between King William of England and Pope Innocent, which was a contributing factor to the crisis which led to the issuing of Magna Carta in 1215. He he is also credited with having divided the Bible into the standard modern arrangement of chapters used today. 
King John, in trying to regain his stature, had to grovel before the Pope and return the title to his kingdoms of England and Ireland to the Pope as vassals and swore submission and loyalty to him. Then King John had to accept Langton as Archbishop of Canterbury and offered the Pope a vassal's bond of fealty and homage, which is swearing an oath. And as, as you all know, um, Matthew 5 says, Swear no oaths. In the Middle Ages, feudalism was based on the exchange of land for military service. King William the Conqueror used the concept of feudalism to reward his Norman supporters, or vassals, for their help in the conquests of England. The land belonging to the English was taken and given to Norman knights and nobles. A vassal would swear allegiance and pay homage to his lord in a commendation ceremony. The commendation ceremony was designed to create a lasting bond between a vassal and his lord. Fealty and homage are a key element of feudalism. The ceremony consisted of swearing the oath of fealty and the act of homage, or becoming humble. Two months later, in July of 1213, the King, King John was absolved of excommunication at Winchester by the returned Archbishop of Canterbury, Langton. On October the 3rd, 1213, by treaty, King John ratified his surrender of his kingdoms to the Pope as Vicar of Christ. Now, we have to understand what a treaty is. It's an agreement under international law entered into by actors. Hmm, very interesting that, isn't it? In inter actors in international law, namely sovereign states and international organizations. A treaty may also be known as an international agreement a protocol, a covenant, a convention, a pact or exchange of letters, among other terms. Regardless of how terminology of all of these forms of agreement are, under international law, equally considered treaties and rules are the same. Treaties can loosely be compared to contracts. Both are means of willing parties assuming obligations among themselves and a party to either that fails to live up to their obligations can be held liable under international law. This will become clearer shortly. The contract or the Treaty of 1213, the Treaty of Verona that was, was between two parties. The barons of England would not put up with them the barons of England would not put up with being slaves anymore, so they took to the sword and made King John sign the Magna Carta. This act of the barons violated the principles of natural law which rendered the Magna Carta as having no force or effect upon a contract between two parties. Pope Boniface the Seventh, the other contracting party, thought so, for he declared the Magna Carta to be unlawful and unjust as, as it is base and shameful, whereby the apostolic see is brought into contempt, the royal prerogative is diminished, the English outraged, and the whole enterprise of the crusade greatly imperiled. So before we look at the Magna Carta, we, we have to go back a couple of years previous to 1213 and the contract called the Treaty of Verona. King John, as most kings, tried to no avail to establish uh, a dictatorship, such as William the Conqueror did. This seems to be the model to follow, and William set a precedent that all kings and queens would try to follow, or at least they would try to push the boundaries further set out in the doctrine written by the Church of Rome. The Pope's main goal was to try and control all the lands of the world under the doctrine that he is the Vicar of Christ, using the myth of Jesus Christ to achieve this, placing him at the top of the chain and by using the myth to his and who he serves benefit. He would proclaim that he was the owner of all lands on behalf of Jesus until such time as Jesus would return and he would supposedly hand it all back to him. Sounds uh, interesting, doesn't it? Contained within this is every living, breathing creature, including us, basically in, sh in servitude to his wishes and all he commands. This was done through a legal system called canon law, the law of contracting that works through fiction as it itself is only fiction. So to set the stage, we have the Pope at the top of the chain, supposedly owning all the land and everything upon it, and canon law as the script for the play, 
and the principles of the script to be that the principles of religion contribute most powerfully to keep nations in the state of passive obedience, including their kings and queens. In being the vicar of Christ, the number one law to be used at first was the fear of God, and this is exactly what was used against King John to make him succumb to the Pope's wishes. How could the Pope declare the Magna Carta unlawful and unjust? The Treaty of Verona 1213 between King John and the Pope was a contract between two parties. Therefore, the arrangement can only be modified or altered by the two signatories, which was the King and the Pope. Now Boniface uh, the 8th, 24th of December 1294 until 11th of October 1303, in 1302 Pope Boniface issued his infamous papal bull, Unum Sanctum, being the first express trust and, con and claimed control over the whole planet and effectively king of the world. So this is where it where it all began. This is where the first invisible change become. The previous Pope started it by, by declaring himself uh, the world his, and then the papal bull, Unum Sanctum, confirmed it. Okay, Pope Boniface VIII was the first leader in history to create the concept of a trust, the first testamentary trust through a deed and will. Creating a deceased estate was not until Pope Nicholas V in 1455 through the papal bull Romanus Ponticus. This is only one of three papal bulls to include the line with the incipit for a perpetual remembrance. That means it never ends. This bull had the effect of conveying the right of uses of the land as real property from the express trust Unum Sanctum to the control of the pontiff and his successors in perpetuity. Hence, all land is claimed as crown land. Now, in 1666, an act was passed to set us free, should we ever understand it. Now, this was called the Sidicae Vi Act, 1666. An act for redress of inconveniences by want of proof of the deceases of persons beyond the seas, or absenting themselves upon whose lives estates do depend. Okay, so if you understand that, you'll understand how it is. Now, we, we just need to look at a few words here. Proof is the establishment by evidence of a requisite degree of belief concerning a fact in the mind of the trier of the fact or the court. Now, Sedicae Trust, a Sedicae Trust is properly pronounced Sestike, but lawyers popularly pronounce it Sestike, from Old French. It's an old-fashioned expression for the beneficiary of a trust. Oh, we need to look at that carefully. An old-fashioned expression for the beneficiary of a trust. So if a Sestike trust was set up on our behalf, we must be the beneficiary. Two, the one who trusts or the person who will benefit from the trust and will receive payments or a future distribution from the trust's assets. Okay, they're telling us here, we are the beneficiary and we will receive payments or a future distribution. In the next video, we'll explain how. But if we understand this, we will know what it is. Sedicae Trust is a barbarous phrase to signify the beneficiary of an estate held in trust. He for whose benefit another person is enfoffed or seized of land or tenements or is possessed of personal property. The Sedicae Trust is entitled to receive the rents and profits of the land. He may direct such conveyances consistent with the trust deed or will as he shall choose and the trustee is bound to execute them. Oh, we just didn't know who we were, did we? He may defend his title in the name of the trustee. So now we will go, go and look a little bit further. Proof of the deceases of persons. Um, they're telling us we need to provide proof that someone has died. So someone has deceased. We can tell you who it is. It's the person. 
In general usage, a human being, a natural person, though by statute, the term may include a firm, a labor organization, partnerships, associations, corporations, legal representatives, trustees, trustees in bankruptcy or receivers. So that is what a person is in law. And trust me, we are one of those. Bovia is online. Oh, that's Black's fifth. Bovia is online person. It is also used to denote a corporation, which is an artificial person. They're telling us there. Now, the other day, I just happened to be looking at this um, Kiwi Bank Merchant Services application form and blow me down. Section 9 here. This is a bit too small to read, so I'll blow it up for you. 9. Important terms and conditions. In this application form, you means the legal person. So we don't want to be you, do we? Because we are the legal person then. Now, if we look at the uh, Imperial Act, Enactments in force, this comes out of the Imperial Laws Application Act 1986. The king willeth and commandeth that common right be done to all, as well as poor as rich, without respect of persons. Now, this statute of Westminster came out in 1275, and they told us not to respect persons, because if we did, we are bound by them. And so the person... The person is dead. So in summary, the Pope puts the world and everyone in the world into trust. The statute of Westminster, the first, warns us, warns us not to respect persons. The CDK Act shows us we need proof to set ourselves free. Proof, according to Black's Fifth, requires an affidavit. In breaking the invisible chains, we will need to clearly identify who we are.